and you'll see you can see how many people are watching well they're watching right now and they're on that camera over there Mick there you are now isn't technology wonderful Mossy Griffin will be on now later he's always on Schlagen Mossy Griffin Baron I know Baron Kerry shouldn't have an opinion on anything you hear that Mossy <laughs> how are you Mossy long time no see buddy you might be on just yet and so I get all the comments here then in real time I'll watch my language so and for some reason uh, we've got I must turn off it, it, it generates closed captions as well which is hysterical because it kind of captures what we're saying and all right. <laughs> a bit like watching the news when you're in a pub in the States it would translate my accent then would it <laughs> <laughs> when uh, Pauline is watching she said she'd tune in oh I texted it about an hour ago yeah yeah Kathleen come back with oh, I didn't see anything advertised <laughs> I thought uh, that sounds like my management right there <laughs> <laughs> will we play a tune? We will. Well, For the first play. time in. Jesus, how long? We played together at Christmas time. Um, Just gone? No. Come. 18 months ago. Because I was in Thailand for last Christmas. But it was the Christmas before that. And it was a Saturday night, and it was you and me and Mick McKay. Oh, that's right. And it was your typical Saturday in Coley's. Oh. <laughs> will we see the like of it again? Well, I don't know how you'll see a crowd in any Crick. establishment under the current Crazy. COVID scenario. Not like that, yeah. I mean, you've got to wonder and worry. I mean, Coley's just one, you know, but he's one um, establishment that sincerely and genuinely loves the music. Mm. And when he first started out back when it was 15 odd years ago, whatever, he was having... Um, he was having three sessions a day, seven days a week. Yeah. Some of the sessions were two musicians and some were three. I mean, that's a serious outgoing of funds. You'd want to be making a serious wedge to be able to afford. So it's, it's like the circle. If the punters ain't coming in to have a drink and listen to the tunes, he's not generating enough money to pay his staff and his bills and then the musicians, you yeah. know. And there are many like him. So uh, the thing about Coley, he, he's so genuinely loves the music and really wants to keep the music house keep the name the reputation and everything and um, this is trying times speaking of music yeah we'll you, give it, we'll you give have it to pick large. them because i played the seven tunes that i know last week with Brendan. i saw that gig and i didn't know any of the tunes <laughs> <laughs> they were session tunes from 20 years ago because oh, they were the well, only ones I could remember oh, Jesus, session tunes from 40 years ago I'm still playing but the last time we played you were lovely tunes and I knew them all so just pick them ones again what about um, Farrell O'Gara yeah I know that one Maids of Castle Bar I know that one and um, oh god um, well let's do two and see how we get out okay. two
idea. That was very nearly might be behind the ball. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> well, I am. I am quite famous for playing a first part of one tune, second part of another tune, first part of a different tune, and the second part of. But that's a wonderful gift. <laughs> <laughs> As Joe Burke would say, when someone called the guards, there's somebody murdered in the maid behind the mare. <laughs> well, Which I nearly murdered her there. He said as well, the old tunes are the best, but it's hard to get parts of them. Yeah. 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 You've got hello, them. hello everybody. This is Mick Keneally. Hi guys. name on the screen. How are you all? Um, a lot of We Band of Three fans that have seen us in uh, the City Winery in Chicago would know Mick's sister Pauline, who's a lovely, lovely banjo player. And she's pretty good in the banjo too. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Me? She might even be listening. She might be. Hi, okay. Pauline. Marianne Kiefer is is online, and Marianne, of course, would know Pauline very, very well. Mary has a, a radio show. Oh in, yeah. Uh, in Chicago. I think Pauline's resting up at the minute. She uh, her, her foot broke a bone or something in her foot lately. Oh yeah. The poor thing. Yeah. So um. Floor. Was there a good story to it? Oh no, it's just a, an accident. Um, for legal reasons, I'm not permitted to share it. No, I'm joking. No, but no, she hurt just. Booting boot somebody up the. No, no, she just. <laughs> I think she was in a supermarket and turned the corner and twisted her ankle or something. Okay. Something bad slipped in some puddle or something. I don't know. But anyway, she's got a bad doing, the poor girl. So. Uh, That's the. Uh, of course, the first thing I think of is uh, her dancing. Because even if she's cooking dinner for the boys, you know, she'll be just. Lepping around the kitchen like Mum used to do. Okay. You know. It's in the blood, but now I don't know. I don't know what if she'll have any of the power to rock or do anything. Why well, not? She wouldn't be dancing seriously at our age now, anyway. But <laughs> at our age. But when you can do don't it, you why wouldn't you? Me in the our age bit. Well, see, me and <laughs> if you look closely, everyone, see, <laughs> smile at the camera. <laughs> if you look very closely, the, 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 the closely guarded secret here is that Ender and I we we use the same colorist. <laughs> That's right. I was fine. I, I had brown hair until I started playing sessions in Coley's and then I know. Play overnight. You would, yeah. I tell Matthew I had brown hair until he was born. Well, see, the, the crowds in Coley's are what, what got you ready for the crowds that you now entertain world, worldwide. Correct. You needed to start somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Oh, very good. Yeah. Um, oh, thanks for inviting me down. It's lovely to be here anyway. And... Uh, I can't see anyone out there, but they can probably see me. So, hello, everyone. They can definitely see you. Yeah. Will we play something else? We will. What do you fancy? Do you fancy a few uh, jigs, maybe? Yes. What about... Um... Oops. I think I've gone a bit flat. Excuse well, me, folks. I was in Mayo for the weekend, so my tuning is a little bit north. <laughs> boy's favourite uncle? On their mother's side. I'm the only boy in the family. <laughs> this gets technical. Well, they're a great bunch of lads. I mean, what are they, 20, 21, 20 and nearly, or 20, 19 and the twins are 18, and the smallest one is like six foot four, you know, it's just giants of men. When I say they look down on me, it's only physically they look down, not, not, not um... The music they look up to me. <laughs> <laughs> See, we're not used to heat in Ireland. The fiddle's going all over the shop. <laughs> now... Jigs? Yeah. What about... Um... And then... Yeah, what's the first one called? Do you Apples and Winter. Okay. Two part version. Da dee dee da 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 it's too early. It's only lunchtime in the US. I know, yeah. We haven't we haven't reached the watershed here, Mr. Howley. <laughs> well, fair play for we you. We do jokes after. 
Oh well, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. So you better start to move. Already went into the wrong key. She doesn't like reels. <laughs> she did not like Jerry the Beaver's hat. Oh, jeez. She's probably from Kerry. She's probably a polka <laughs> fan. It is the queasiest kind of dog. Martin Howley seems like good harvesting the garden tune. Well, there you go. Jean McCabe says Viz is not as funny as it used to be. It depends where you look. What does that mean? <laughs> well, when, well, when we were kids. For those of you who don't know, I'm from North London, okay? So, um, very North London, right? So, Scotland? Too. Well, not that far north, but nearly, right? So, um, you know your geography, hey? <laughs> I know London, <laughs> Scotland. That's it. And there's a northern line going straight up there, yeah. in between it. So, no, so anyway, um, years and years and years ago when I was young, uh, up in Newcastle in the university, a, a rag mag started up, you know, just a kind of 
a published thing, you know, that they do on the on campus, I think. But uh, that's the that's what I read anyway. And and apparently it grew into this. It was so popular it actually became a legit published magazine every month. But it's it's like a it's like a comic cartoon, but it's for adults, and it has loads of. Um, characters in it like a, a TV presenter who uses expletives in front of the Queen at the local garden fate you know and he gets sacked from his job because he he dropped the sea bomb in front of her majesty you know was there a, was there a was there a strip called plastic bag or something uh, well like plastic bag I can't I can't remember but they see that they have loads of like diehard ones like um, Roger Melly the man on the telly now he's a fella who used to get sacked for swearing in front of the Queen and stuff and then his producer would get sacked as well. And then there was other ones called, um, well, I can't really say, but um, basically it was an adult comic. But the thing, and what Martin Howley was on about earlier as well about Viz was um, the the character Roger Melly. Um, he, he he didn't mince his words, and uh, all of the ways he used to swear or describe something, he had a million ways of describing, say, like a broken thumb or part of the anatomy that we can't mention live on air but this dictionary was born of all the profanities that he would have given birth to over the years in the magazine and I actually downloaded the app on my phone and it's the best thing it's, it's what iPhone was invented for the, the <laughs> viz profanisaurus anyone out there it is absolutely side splitting I, I absolutely cry every day when it comes up with the word of the day and I'm literally you know going to the toilet it's the best thing ever so they have a million different ways of describing you know anything but it's adult um, you know let's let's be straight it's an adult thing but um so the dictionary you've heard of like the Oxford dictionary and Roger's thesaurus well this is Roger's profanosaurus a bit of a word play on Roger's thesaurus but it's Roger's profanosaurus and it's, I mean, they talk about anything, piercings, you know, anything, oh, just anything. It's, it's just the best thing ever. <laughs> if Kieran O'Hare is watching, he will, what, what's the expression that made him laugh? I sent him one day, it was, um, no, I can't remember. And even if I could, I'd better, I'd better not mention it. But I think Kieran knows what I'm talking about anyway. What's this? This is a, a Greek bazooki. And I am, uh, I've had this 20 years um in fact 22 years and they're, they're not really supposed to last that long um as you can see it's like a uh, a tear shaped front belly and then as you turn it sideways you can see the belly is 3d like a bowl and the neck is very thin and uh beautiful and, and this is a six string version which um and there are eight string versions as well but um i never heard of one of these or ever saw one of these until as a kid, you know, mum and dad bought home in about 1974 or something, our first Dead Annan album. And, you, you know, as kids, you know, you just, there was no digital world at all then. There was no phones or mobile phones rather or computers, nothing. So we, you know, when we got a record sleeve, we would scour it from back to front and read every last note. Shanaki were brilliant in New York for their sleeve and liner notes and the beautiful designs on some of their early albums I thought were amazing. Uh, effort went into some of that but I'd never seen a bazooki before and I immediately fell in love with it and uh, the look of it the sound of it just the simplicity of it on, on, on how beautiful it can make something like Ender could be playing just the most drop dead brilliant music and then just when you'd, you couldn't think it would get any better which it can't really but then I might come in <laughs> and just start weaving a bit of colour in and not that he needs any of that you know He's got the fine brush, I've got the roller, I'd say. And uh, I just weave a bit of magic and whatever is brilliant just is a little bit nicer, maybe. How's it tuned? It's tuned like the same three strings, top strings on a banjo or a fiddle. So E, A, D, but then the top E is tuned down to D. So it's actually D, A, D. Okay. And that's traditional Greek modal tuning. And if you are of the flatback bazooki family, which this was, which was born out of this. I mean, this is the granddaddy of them all. So um, the reason I went for six string was because I just fell in love with Alex Finn's music from the very moment I ever heard him and Dedanon or him and Frankie Gavin's first album. Just any fiddle players out there, if you haven't got that first Frankie album in your 
collection you're missing a vital building block in my opinion it's only my humble opinion um why, why is it really old at 20 years what, what well because that? unlike a guitar and other kind of more um, robust instruments the greek bazooki from an engineering point of view it's quite amazing how the neck doesn't fold up normally the neck might just go like that and that would happen if you use too heavy a gauge of string. So I'm really careful on my on my gauge of string because you don't want to put too much force on the neck. But there, would, there wouldn't be a truss rod in here like in a banjo or a guitar. Mm. Like, that, that's a beautiful instrument. I mean, that's a serious weapon in a row. Whereas I'd only hurt myself hitting someone with it, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'd come away crying because it'd measure, be in bits. It's the measure of every instrument. But, well, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. So anyway, thanks for that. So, so anyway, um, yeah, it's just, um, because I look after mine, it's lasted, but generally, and, and I'm very careful where I keep it in the house, it's not too hot, not too cold, uh, never near heat, you know. Uh, Why aren't they more popular? Because there's literally a handful of musicians that play this bazooki versus the flatback, which yeah. is really popular. It's, 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 a, it's a good question, and really, I'm not going to be one to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not one, uh, and I wouldn't be qualified to preach 21, I can only speak from my own experience. When I first saw Alec and heard Alec playing, I was just hook, line and sinker immediately. I couldn't get over just how beautiful this was, especially Mary Bergen's first album, Father mm -hmm. Stein one, the first album, oh my God. The bloke, I think that was as good, you know, and it, it was that good then. And you know, he was that good all the way to, to the very end, God rest him. Um, his standard of playing and just, the beautiful thing he did. I used to sit in front of the, ra the radiogram playing that record and just rocking and crying. I couldn't believe just how, just how, it, it was like, you know, this hand come out and just grabbed your heart and give it a good old ring out and there you go, son, you've had your rush for the day. You know, that was my mm. fix. Yeah. And I loved it so much. I, I, uh, I never dreamt I'd ever own one or play one. And I never dreamt I'd ever meet them and play with them and everything. So, uh, very lucky boy. I, I think I am, um, and I, and I, you know, I'm very thankful for the opportunity I had to play with all of them lads. Brilliant. But I went with this because I think the, I think the flatback players normally come from a guitar scenario, and they're used to that strum, whereas we don't. We we don't strum. We kind of pick and hammer and weave, mm. and. Um, you know, it's much more textural than rhythmical, isn't it? It is, um, so I'm, I'm hammering and weaving, so, so my accompaniment would be so behind you, you know, not in your face or not forcing the rhythm or anything like that. Um, and whereas uh, anyone who strums a guitar, when they're brilliant, as a lot of, I mean, the standard today in, of musicians is, I mean, it's just unbelievable, nearly everyone is brilliant. I remember one time in Milltown, Malbay, years ago, teaching the fiddle, these two girls come in, I think one was nine and one was 10. And the oldest people in my class were my age, you know, there were a real good um, spectrum of, of, of ages and, and um, experiences in the class. And this one girl, nine years of age, I'll tell you, I, I could not believe she had everything. She had everything already. I'm thinking, oh, I'm only holding you back, girl. You know, yeah. what are you doing? I, I, I've, I've never seen anything like it. it. It was a real shock that someone that young had it already and had all the technicals. I think she was taught by, um, Terry Crehan in Dublin, brilliant, brilliant fiddle player and a good teacher, good guy, I haven't seen him in a long time, but uh, um, this girl just had it, you know. Um, anyway, I'll keep going off on a tangent, but this, because I'm not a strummer, I don't play guitar and I don't have that brilliant rhythm like say Mick McCaig or R.T. God rest him or, or John Doyle or any, you know, I, I just don't have that. Hmm. Even though I have it in the bow, but not, but. Um, we'll play the cat's me out. We, we'll, we'll try. Cats Meow, one of Joni, Joni Madden's compositions. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant tune. Hello Joni, if you're listening. I have to do the sound engineer here as well. So. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, it's such a gorgeous That's thing. lovely. It's nice, and uh, you know, I really love it because, well, I don't know why. <laughs> you, you, you know what, you don't, you don't even have to, to all the young kids out there who are playing music and want to learn something, you know, you can learn whatever you want and listen to whatever you want because, you know, when you hear a song on the radio, for the first time ever, you're driving down the road and you think, oh God, that's amazing. Hmm. Oh God, I love that. Immediately, immediately you just know it's grabbed you, right? But why? It doesn't matter why. As long as your heart tells you, that is. I had, a, I had one of them moments, I don't get them moments often, right? But I had one of them moments uh, very recently and, and it wasn't an Irish traditional music scenario either. I was watching a program on TV on Netflix I don't know if you're into Ricky Gervais at all. Have you seen Afterlife? I've seen season one. I haven't seen season two yet. Right. It's fantastic. Right. I, I really thought that was brilliant. And um, But maybe being from North London, you know. Scotland. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, the English and the Irish have a very similar sense of humour, you know. Um, I might say something in Ireland or England and it, it would go down well. And in America, they might not know what, what I'm talking about. Uh, which is probably a good thing, really. Um, but anyway, there was one episode in this Afterlife programme where um, well, the, the series is his wife dies and he's trying to deal with the loss. And at the end of one episode, you know, he's kind of drinking himself and he, he falls asleep on the couch or something. But And at the end of the programme, this mu at the end of each programme, some music kicked in. And I think it was series two... The six episodes in each series, I think it was series two, episode five. It's quite and specific. No, well, I mean, you know, it's, uh, and the song that came in, it was quite poignant and it was quite sad, the scene that had just been on, and suddenly this piano came in. And it was nice and slow and a beautiful chord progression. And the first thing I thought of was, that sounds like a hymn. And... I got my phone out and I got Spotify and I quickly um, identified what it was. And it was a song from Billy Joel called, um, Jesus, what's it, what was it called? Oh, God, I've just gone blank now. That's a senior moment, you know. Right? No, but it was a Billy Joel song, which I'd never heard. And everyone knows him for Uptown Girl and all the famous stuff, and you know. And I tell you, I nearly cried. I couldn't believe how beautiful this was. I mean, it was almost like a slow air. I, could, I, I, I closed my eyes and I could imagine Lee and my Flynn playing it or some piper playing it with like, Don Lonnie on the synth or something behind. Or, you know, it just, it just had... And, and afterwards, then, I, I downloaded the lyrics as well. And oh my God. Oh my God! If you if you're kind of any way romantic and stuff, I mean, Rebel. you would. Oh, the the woman would melt in your arms, man. Oh, it was just. I mean, talk. I mean, I, I was actually sick at myself that I'd never heard this before. How often I've never come across this song before, you know? And I had one of them hairs standing on the back of your neck moments, going, Jesus, that was just so heartbreaking, does stunning, that, stunning. Does that happen when when you play hornpipes on the fiddle? It did. Well, yeah, horny pipes. Or, or as, as an old fellow once said to me one night, he came up to me and he said, um, do, do, you know, do you know any horn dances? A horn dance. <laughs> A horn dance. Whatever that is. The song is called And So It Goes. And So It Goes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Da, 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 da. Hi, Jill. How are you, darling? Do you want to watch, do you want to watch a video of yourself playing in Kansas City? Uh, myself and Dave? Yeah. This is, this is uh, a video from Kansas City in 2013, the first year that we played Kansas City. Was it? That's the first yeah. year I played there. And you guys were there. And with, the last. With the, <laughs> with the inimitable, hint, hint. inimitable Dave Munley, who I had on here a couple of weeks, a good few weeks ago, chatting. Was he, he was, in or just we no, do No, he wasn't in. We, he was we doing it remotely. Side, but it was brilliant. He was so funny. Dave's unreal. Ah, uh, such a good guy. Enjoy this. This is a few minutes and then we'll be back.
Mike Keneally right here. I, I, I actually, would you believe, I actually watched that. Those, there's a few of them clips. There's the, there are three clips that that guy, whoever he is, um, took. And if you're watching, hello. But there are three clips he took and put up on YouTube from that time. And uh, I, I look at them all the time, uh, basically wishing I was back there playing with Dave, you know. Because Dave moved to um, Holland back mm -hmm. about 11 years ago, I think. And he only moved home this January. And we haven't, we haven't basically played in 10 years. Wow. You used to play in Coley's the whole time, didn't oh, well, That's how we started, in Matt Malloy's and then yeah. Coley's. Uh, and we hadn't played for a few years. And then in September last year, in preparation, before you moved home, we put a few, we put a few gigs together, three in fact, in Ireland uh, in September. I never forget the 18th, 19th and 20th. I can remember this stuff because we do so few work. Uh, I mean, I remember where I played on St. Patrick's Day in 1991, for God's sake. Do you know right. what I mean? I do so many few gigs. But, yeah. Where'd you, where'd you play? Uh, the Great American Music Hall in O'Farrell Street in San Francisco. <laughs> so I used to tour with Manus McGuire. Yes. And Paul Brock. And Manus could remember dates. So we'd be driving into Cincinnati, Ohio, for instance. Yeah. And Manus would turn around and he'd go. Now this was 15 years ago, right? Yeah. And Manus would go, 1982. <laughs> Wednesday night. Yeah, yellow socks. He'd name the, probably. Yeah. He'd name the venue. And then he was able to name the promoter. So gigs that he had done 25 years wow. prior to that. He could he remember the day he was there. Yeah. I couldn't remember what I had for breakfast that morning. I'd be like, what city are we in today again? Yeah. Cincinnati? It's funny, by the 18th of September last year, we did three gigs. We did one, first of all, in the Crane Bar here in Sea Road. Gorgeous venue upstairs, as you know, you've played there in the early days. And then uh, the next day was a Thursday night, and that we played in Matt Malloy's so as a sellout. And no, not one local in it, or one musician, but it was packed. <laughs> Unbelievable. And um, then the following day, Friday, it was Clifton Arts Week, and we played in uh, the midday session, uh, an hour-long concert in the Church of Ireland there. Absolutely stunning mm -hmm. acoustics. Um, even though we hadn't played in that long, we, uh, we really pulled it out of the bag. Uh, I was quietly shocked and absolutely delighted with ourselves because I really needed some quality tunes. Well, Hence why I'm here today, folks. Quality. quality, quality. Matthew, Do you see this? Matthew Martinson is very excited about Do you see this? This is an O, and if you had a thing hanging down here, it would be a Q for quality. But he doesn't have anything hanging down there, just in case you're wondering. What's that? Ask a Q there. <laughs> Brilliant. Questioning. No. Questionable quality. <laughs> Questionable it's quality. quality. Not at all. <laughs> but you had some arm pipes there while we were having a break. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, they're in D anyway. They're in D. I remember and the second one. The first one is called. Um, the first one is called, uh, is it Kitty's, no, is it Daniel O'Connell, the Home Ruler, is the first one. Yes. And the second one is uh, Kitty's Wedding, I think. No, no, that's, uh, that's Miss Galvin's you're playing there. Is that the other one you've played? No? The second one is... Well, that's the same, no? <laughs> it all sounds the same. Play. I might it all play sound... I play my one and you play your one. Yeah, yeah. harmony guy, <laughs> harmony, yeah. It all sounds the same, do you know what I mean? As Alex said, you know, on the bazooki, there's only two notes, an A and a D, you know. Rhythm and counterpoint and melody, you know, do you remember harmony. Pat, do you remember Pat Power? Do you remember Pat was a banjo player? You, you know, Nicky Power played Yeah, Power. yeah, yeah, yes. And so Nick's brother, Pat. Yeah. Pat busks down in Killarney. If, you, if anyone has been to Killarney, and you'll see him, he's on the street, and he has all of the... Um, the little figurines and he wires them all up to a battery and then he plays music and they dance yeah yeah so, I know that, yeah. so Pat used to live in Galway yeah. and he was a banjo player great banjo player mad as a hatter in the most gorgeous way like yeah. this lovely fella but completely mad and he said he, he, he was he said oh, she said a great session that are right in the crane <laughs> he said Frankie Gavin Alec Finn Jesus mighty and uh, somebody said um were they not tuned to E flat? You know, because Frankie was always yeah. be tuned up. They were! I played away in D anyway! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but knowing the boys, they probably transposed down, didn't they? You know, because, yeah. because they can. Effortlessly, yeah. yeah. Oh. Anyway. Mind tune? You are.
don't tell me we didn't practice. We did. <laughs> of course we did. They are lovely, yeah. Do you, Kitty's wedding. Yeah. Do you prefer leading the tunes or being led? And I, I would say that in the sense of when we were watching you playing with Dave, and Dave really drives. Oh, yeah. Well, you, you know, Dave is, is, is like a force of nature. He's, he's, he's so powerful himself. Like, he actually... I'm not going to do my career any good here. He actually doesn't need me at all. You know, on his own. I mean, I'd sit and listen to him in the snow. I mean, he yeah. is just to die for. Well, I he, think loves, he's, he loves playing with you, and so there, yeah. there's a synergy. But, but we, we, we have a spark. We have something. And you don't get that with everyone you play with. But mm-hmm. I, I, uh, it's, we've got a particularly strong connection. You mm-hmm. know, um, He would be the, um, the, the main... I mean, we're lucky because both our rhythm is good anyway. So when, when, we, when, we, when we lock together for tunes it's mm-hmm. it, it rocks you know it's uh it, but he would be the main driver no question it, it's just so powerful and as a duo i mean when we met you that time in kansas back when was it 2013 yeah. was it oh, bloody hell um you know like i remember getting up on stage after a full band that had drums and a bass guitar and keyboards and everything and us two <laughs> paddy's getting up on the stage like with a box and the fiddle and you know i bet the crowd are wondering jesus what's going on here yeah and even we didn't know how it would go down after such a full sound that had been on before us. Uh, but see, Dave's, Dave is the accompaniment. And, I'm, I, I, and I've got a strong love for self-accompaniment as well. Like I'd, I'd throw in, you know, kind of some chords and mm. runs and stuff like that. But Dave is just so, I mean, his, his bass hand is to die for. And he, I've heard some people recently, you know, ask, God, his bass is very complicated, isn't it? Uh, my answer to that would be, well, it is, because he can. <laughs> you know, why does a dog lick his mana You know what I mean? Because he can. Dave, Dave. Pauline said not to tell him. That's not a joke. That's real. That's true. That's the truth, I'll tell you, Dale boy. No, but the thing is that Dave is so musical. And, I mean, he's got extra basses put on the box with the full scale and everything. So he can pull yeah. a colour out of anything mm. outside of the standard eight buttons and I could listen to his bass all day now obviously if he's playing with an accompanist if there's a piano or a guitar or something with us then of course he'll hold back on the left hand because it could clash or over drown the bazooki or whatever it might be do you yeah, know yeah, yeah. but when it's just a duet me and Dave his, his left hand I just he's got free reign just away and every gig could be different he'd put a different colour in somewhere else and that one of them little runs I did a minute ago and that hornpipe I, I was horribly exposed I do apologise but the thing is I can hide behind Dave I can, I can pull you know I can make yeah, savage yeah. mistakes I'm and hiding. laugh because Dave's <laughs> Dave's that kind of wall oh, in front yeah. of us But I'm hiding behind you right now oh, yeah. it's fine but I'm hiding behind you so where does that leave us? <laughs> exposed <laughs> exposed, exposed. Yeah. <laughs> talking of exposed I remember once I think it was back in the I think my first time ever in Milltown Mel Bay 1984 uh, the Willie Clancy Summer School and I was 17 years old and it was the first time mum and dad ever let me come over to Ireland on my own without them, you know. And I was with a great gang of people, Kevin Crawford from Lunasa. If you're watching Kevin, is he, he is. on? Yeah. Jeez, Kev, what's the story? I tried Skyping you last night, you dirty thing. Where were you? <laughs> anyway, I just missed you by a minute. But anyways, um, the, myself, Kevin Crawford, Joe Malloy, Brendan Boyle, a, a group of lads we used to play together in Birmingham years ago. And <laughs> Ste- uh, steady, Mick. Steady. So it's Kevin. So anyway, right. Um, it, it was the most life-changing week for me. I remember being in Milltown. We going to Queeley's pub while it was open. Then, uh, God, it'd be Noel Hill, Tony Lennon, Alec Finn playing in the corner. These these are guys we'd only ever seen on the back of a record LP cover. Do you know? Okay. It was a complete game changer. Um, and I remember seeing. Frankie Gavin and Alec Finn walking up the main street of yeah. Milltown Albay in the middle of the street with like cars behind them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, like, they're like the Beatles. Like a funeral <laughs> cortege or something. <laughs> wrong wrong comparison there. But anyway, um, the, the thing I was saying was, um, what was I going to say? I forgot what I was going to say. 1984. Yeah. Milltown Albay. Milltown. I know. I've Life, life-changing experience. Yeah. I can't remember what I was going to say. How sad is that? Everything. When you get to my age, Kevin, right, and everyone else out there, <laughs> you'll know what about it. What was I going to say? Jesus, that's shocking. It was very interesting. A senior moment. I made it sound good, didn't I? No, what was I going to say? But Milltown, you know, 
We were talking about being in Queely's kitchen. Oh yeah, and you know, you'd be standing next to people like, and listening to people, and you'd be pinching yourself going, God, is this really happening? And uh, that trip opened my whole life to, because to, if, if I didn't go there and repeatedly went to go to Milltown, I, God knows where we'd have ended up, you know, would I still be playing now? Hmm. Milltown Mountain was amazing. Yeah. We went there as teenagers. Yeah. Playing with Mick McCauley. Brilliant. And John Brilliant. Dolan. In the middle of a session, about like 50 people. Yeah. And they were the centrepiece. Yeah. And oh, driving wow. it. I would have stopped everyone else playing, just to leave the two of them alone. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Big sessions don't work for me. No, I don't like big ones either. No, I um, small sessions. Unless I mean, we're, we're just getting grumpy as we get older, do you know what I mean? Well, that's definitely. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you snob. Who do you think total, you are? Total well, actually. Session curmudgeon here, for yeah. sure. Yeah. I don't like when it gets homogenized. And so if you have too many people in a session, just yeah. by weight of number, it becomes homogenized, the music. Whereas if you have three or four and there's that pull, or you have, and, and then you can feel that one person that's kind of leading it. I like to sit yeah. in behind other musicians, yeah, yeah. not not drive it myself. I, 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 so they get lost. If there's a beautiful tune going on, and Kevin will notice, uh, he's probably seen me in action as well, but if there's a really beautiful tune, and in fairness, Kevin would be the same as me. Um, if there's a lovely tune going on and then and a another comes in and completely ruins it i'm straight in i'm straight into the juggler and that's enough of that you know just put it away have a pint and just sit and enjoy the quality right i i, I can't do one person killing the whole night for everyone i i, I, I life's too short i feel really guilty as a banjo player right now no I don't <laughs> <laughs> Well, you should have played the fiddles, didn't you? I'm only joking, no. <laughs> I tried, I couldn't get over to squeaking at the start. I remember one night, I, I'm not mentioning any names, but um, some, some people, some, no, no, some, very, some people are very dear to me, and uh, not only are they dear to me, but their music is just, I love it so much. Some of my favourite musicians ever were having a lovely tune one night, and uh, uh, this bloke come in with a guitar. Now, we know the guy in question, and he's a gent, and they're a lovely fella, and really good fun. I, I really like the guy, but musically, uh, it, it just... You know, there's nothing kind of musically of interest for me with this fella. Anyway, he got the guitar out and he played all night and completely killed the session. And because I like the guy and, and you don't want to upset anyone, you know, I didn't say anything, right? And But my night was ruined, you know. And, and everyone's night was ruined, right? And at the end of the night, your man's putting a guitar away and he turns to a friend of mine and he said... Uh, what, what did you think of the guitar tonight, right? And my friend just says, well, what did you think about it? You know what I mean? <laughs> what did you think yourself? It was <laughs> just cutting straight. He never entered a session again. I don't think the poor man, he's retired from music. After one night. Yay! Right. <laughs> Our life's too short, lads. You've got to enjoy it. Quality. We should play something before yeah. we get into any more trouble. Actually, I just, I'm noticing the blue. Can you see the blue on, on, the, on the neck of the banjo here? kind of like it's turquoise is it turquoise it was supposed to be completely non-colorful banjo because when i was getting it made i was really tired it's of... a bit man city but you can't behave in that you know what i mean <laughs> but you know how banjos are particularly prone to lots of gold leaf and lots of intricate inlays and yeah like they really go over the top and i was just so tired of gold and silver and everything so i said i want essentially a black banjo how much of it can we make completely black and so that's why the wood is stained black. Yeah, it's lovely. Um, and then he said, what about the inlay? And I was like, black. Yeah. And he goes, I have turquoise. <laughs> I was like, we well, like turquoise. Is that turquoise on your wrist as well? Yeah. Right. So I ended up, the, yeah, it's kind of like for old retired hippies or people who think they want to be hippies. Which is me, inspired old. yet again old. by Milton Malbe, which yeah. was my first exposure to hippies. Well, like, the, reason I, the reason I asked the question, it's beautiful by the way, but the reason yeah. I asked the question is Johnny Ringo McDonough, my dear old buddy, who I haven't seen in a couple of years, shame on me. Uh, Johnny wears turquoise. He has a bracelet -y thing, and I think he has a ring or two. Like and he uh, used to smoke cigarettes, you know, and the small Bic lighters, he had a case made. So um, the lighter would just slot into this turquoise case, right? And this is a true story. So we live, I live about half an hour away from here in Oranmore in Galway. And at the time, 
Ringo only used to live about two minute walk around the corner from me, right? So, so this is the baron player with the Dunnan. The original Johnny Ringo McDonald. Yeah, the the, the, the father of the baron, the number one, the the, the man himself. Yeah. Uh, I love him to death. Great guy. So anyway, uh, he used to live about a minute's walk, two minutes walk around the corner from me, and not too far, just outside the village, uh, there is um, a, a waste disposal centre where you can bring things that the rubbish man might take away, you know, like an old broken microwave or whatever it was. So anyway, it's really funny. Johnny was in the tip one day getting rid of some stuff and he lost his lighter, this, this turquoise lighter, right? And then a couple of days ago, uh, another brilliant baron player who lives not too far away from the locale in Oranmore where we are, um, Jimmy Higgins, Jr. Jimmy would play with the Stunning and he played with you know, Martin, Martin O'Connor and stuff. Brilliant Baron player. And he was in the tip doing something and something caught his eye. And he picked it up and he recognised it as Johnny's. I mean, you couldn't make this up. I mean, talk about, talk about pure chance and luck. <laughs> so he, he picked it up and he brought it back and, and, and the story goes, Ringo got the lighter back again. But one night a few years ago, I never knew this when it happened, right? But a few years ago, we were having a few tunes in a pub in Claren Bridge. Um, and I was playing with the piper Tommy Kane and his wife Jacqueline. And I think uh, Breeder Smith came in, who was Jimmy's wife. And I'm not sure it was Jimmy there that night. No, he wasn't, but Breeder came in and she, we had a few tunes anyway. And uh, Tommy w was telling Breeder this story about how Ringo lost the lighter and, and Jimmy found it. And uh, when, when, but whoever told Tommy, I think it must have been Ringo or Jimmy Higgins, you know, I think Ringo was telling Tommy Kane the story about the lighter anyway. And he goes, and Jimmy found it. And Tommy was just amazed at how two Baron players could be in, in the same area and one lose something and the other one find it. And Tommy goes, why, is there a special area for Baron players at the tip, you know? <laughs> You could, but Tommy, he's so, you know, he's brilliant wit. He just said it so quick. He just, you know, I, know I, didn't, I didn't give that one justice. It, it, it was a lot better than that. But it, it really was. That was pretty good. Believe me, that it was, was so much better than that. Will we play one for the road? We will. Before we go, I'm just going to show, show this. Because Do you want fiddle or bazooka or what? Uh, fiddle. Okay. I haven't so, played in four months, Jesus. I was telling you about this, Mick. Just today we've launched, we Banjo 3 have launched a virtual festival. Oh, yeah. On the 29th of August. Uh, it's called Follow the Light. Uh, the headliners are Gaelic Storm, Sharon Shannon, uh, the East Pointers from Canada, Nathan Carter, who's a huge uh, Irish star, and we Banjo 3. We're going to be there because it's our festival, so we get to play at it. Um, and there's another festival that I don't get to play at with Dave. There you are. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Mick won't be there. I won't be there. I'll get you a ticket. Oh, brilliant. No, yeah. no. I'll, so you I'll, can I'll be... watch online while you're not there. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> and I'll see two empty seats on the stage. Yeah. Yeah. So get on, uh, if you go to webanjo3.com, you will see uh, we have tickets on sale right now. Uh, we'd love to see you there. It's going to be a great night. What are we going to finish up with? What are we playing? That's a great idea, by the way, because, uh, you know, in the current world we are, we find ourselves in. We are now in a virtual world, Mick. People are starving yeah. for music and they can't get out. So I'm very lucky. I have a full time job during the day, so. But, you know, a lot of my friends are full-time musicians and they just don't, uh, you know, suddenly the income stream is gone. Yes. And it's, uh, you know... And has been highlighted this week online, go and buy people's CDs. Don't... Because you saw that interview with the guy from Spotify. No. Yeah, you can check it out. It was been shared, shared widely. He basically said musicians just need to release more music if they want to make any money on Spotify. So he's been roundly criticised. Mm. Um, essentially, if you buy a CD... Or even if you buy it on iTunes, if you buy an album on iTunes, the musicians get like five or six dollars or five or six euro. Whereas if you go and you play it 400 times on Spotify, we'll still get about 40 to 50 cent. Right. It is a bit wild. Yeah. Anyway, things can only get better. Yes. So what do we play? Anything on your mind? No. I've already played the seven tunes that I know last week. Uh, well, um, I'll just check my tuning thing on. Cause the tuning is fine. And if it's not, it's my tuning.
modern inconvenience, Mick. Should have pegged the accordion. Then you'd have no gigs. <laughs> and you'd be single. That's right. So, um... <laughs> That's right. That's right. God. Um, do the Danny ones. Okay, um... Okay, what about um, the Sunny Banks? Lovely. Um, better no? No. Okay. What about... Um, They're two tunes. What's so the, the first one is Daniel Bryan's, and the second one is um, Jesus. I recorded these on years ago. I'll back you. Oh. You know. What you Thanks everyone, nice to see you. Thanks for watching.